Okay, everybody. Uh, good evening. It is I, your your fearless uh, host, Matt Yancic. I'm the founder and head game master here at Manufactured Myth and Ledger Domain, and welcome to another episode of Role Player with a Thousand Faces. I'm I'm pretty excited uh, about tonight's episode because we are going to take a look behind the scenes tonight. So ordinarily, I would be bringing you a game master or I'd be bringing you um, somebody that paints or draws, or but I'm bringing you someone that in a way kind of does like all of that stuff from behind the scenes. But, um, you know, it wouldn't be a, sh a show opening if I didn't just say that and then immediately switch to some previews of things I have coming up. Um, but before I even do that, I, I kind of wanted to say thank you very much to all of the people that have been signing up and subscribing to the channel. I am a very small potato. Uh, and trust me, I appreciate every single viewer and subscriber that, that joins the channel. Um, I'm not trying to get rich. I'm not looking for fortune and glory. Uh, I'm just looking to bring really interesting people uh, and really interesting games and, and really interesting stuff to, to the viewers out there. So thank you so much for signing up. If you're interested in following us, uh, because it's not just me, it's a few other people on the channel too. We have Steve and we have Frank and uh, we have Larry and, and a whole host of others. Um, you can check us out and talk to us directly on, uh, we have a Discord. Uh, we are on Facebook and uh, we are actually also on Twitter. So if you're interested in following any of our adventures or any any of our, you know, hijinks, uh, please do um, check us out on any of those platforms. Um, so speaking of cool people, uh, I wanted to make an announcement about a few interviews that I have coming up soon. Um, so I have one coming up actually uh, just this coming Saturday, the 8th. So I will be talking to Jonathan Hicks, who is the creator of Those Dark Places. Um, and for those of you that aren't really familiar with Those Dark Places, uh, this is a rules light system that sort of focuses in on industrial science fiction. So it's the sort of science fiction that you would see in films like Alien or Outland. And I sort of mentioned this before, but the truth is I think I'm going to really uh, actually sort of I think the focus of our discussion is going to end up being um, films like Outland and Dragon Slayer because if you watch or if you read Jonathan Hicks, uh, his stream, or I should say his Twitter feed, he talks a lot about his influences and it, like he's like a checklist of all the cool stuff that w inspired me when I was younger um, and, uh, and, and now like kind of fuels me now that I'm older. Um, also, coming up later on in October, we have a show returning that I actually haven't, um, I haven't really, basically haven't focused on in uh, a while. Um, I have GMs in the Machine coming back, and I have a couple very cool game masters that are going to be on. For those of you that aren't familiar with GMs in the Machine, essentially I sit down with a game master guest, and we design together either an actual play or a, uh, a game uh, or maybe an episode in a longer campaign. We talk about settings and world building, and as we're going, I ask annoying questions about what the game master is thinking thinking, why they're choosing to do what they're doing, um, why they don't choose this thing over this other thing. Uh, and I s generally, I just slow the process down and, and for, uh, I sort of take on the form of a wrench and I throw myself in the works. But that's all to bring knowledge and information to you uh, who might be interested in watching and seeing how game masters work behind the scenes. Um, but Enough of my tomfoolery. I have spoken for far too long. I have, I, you can, you know, you guys know I'm an English teacher and I tend to just go on and on and on. Uh, enough of that. You really didn't come here to talk to me. Um, I am excited tonight because I actually have the production designer and creative producer uh, that that's behind the scenes and actually in some ways, and we're kind of going to get into this, but I've, I've, from the interviews I've seen, he's actually up there too, uh, making some uh, pretty big decisions about the flow of the game. Uh, I'm talking to Rick Perry tonight. So without further ado, I'm, I'm just going to get the camera off of me, and we're going we're gonna to zoom Rick in. Um, zo uh, Rick, thank you so much for, for joining us this evening. Um, 
I appreciate your time and I appreciate you coming on the program. How is it going tonight? Howdy. Uh, thank you so much for having me on, Matt. Uh, it's going well. Uh, yeah. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing okay. I, I think I was telling you before the stream, I am nervous as usual. Every time I do one of these things, I'm nervous and, and I get worried mm -hmm. that I'm going to screw it up because I, I'm so happy to have people like yourself on the program. So, so Rick, before we kind of get into like the nitty gritty and all of that, could you tell me a little bit about... Um, what is a production designer and, and what's a creative producer and, and what's a dimension 20? I'm just kind of curious. <laughs> um, dimension 20 is an actual play show from college humor. So uh, it's uh, seven or four comedians uh, playing dungeons and dragons or another tabletop RPG. Um, it's a fairly produced in the sense that we uh, do post, we edit it, we add music and uh, sound effects and kind of polish it a little bit. And you can find it on dropout.tv, which is College Humor's uh, platform. Uh, and I'm the production designer and creative producer. So uh, I'm responsible for kind of the visual side of things um, in a nutshell, from the set to the table to the miniatures. Uh, less of the post stuff, actually, more more in pre-production and production. Um, and then as a creative producer, um, it sort of represents the early part of, of that job, which is kind of developing a season, developing a, an idea and battle concepts and arcs and beats in a, in a kind of... Um, it's an anthology series, so we have, you know, six episodes or 20 episodes, so it's important to sort of have a complete... Um, vision and a landing place for it. So I get to I get to be involved in that stuff too, which is really fun for me. Yeah, that was something um, I did. Uh, I did a little bit of, of background and, and looking into interviews with you. And that was something that actually really interested me was the way and I hope we can talk about it a little bit later. But I was very interested in the idea. I, I never really thought about it before. I'd often thought of production design as okay, you build this, you build that you're responsible for uh, not to minimize it, because those of you that watch the channel also know that I have a background in production as well. Um, but I always sort of saw it as something where people kind of order things up. But what's interesting about doing it for an actual play is that the things that you create are are played with by the participants mm -hmm. and, and by the, the talent on, on the show. And so it has to sort of work in a different way and be a little bit maybe more like smart material than say just a, a, a dumb mini that's just sort of sitting there and doesn't do any thinking. It's got to sort of have a few aspects to it. Um, but before we kind of get to that, can you tell me a little bit about, um, obviously you're you're an incredibly creative person. Were you, in, were you so creative in your childhood? Did you kind of know you were destined to do something? I mean, I'm looking at your background and I feel like <laughs> that background doesn't happen by accident. That is destiny. But were you like this as, well, as a I child? I got this background and then that's where it all started. No, uh, <laughs> that, that's um, right. And it's actually, it's a green screen actually. So <laughs> Right. <yeah. laughs> um, no. Uh, yeah. I, I grew up in, uh, in central Texas and in, in the hill country and uh, I was uh, just kind of a country kid. And um, I, I was definitely always into uh, visual arts and um, uh, kind of my, my whole life, I studied drawing and painting in college. And um, uh, yeah, so so definitely oriented that way. Um, and uh, I, you know, gaming, I, I always, you know, played video games and stuff as a kid. And um, uh, I, I heard about this thing called Dungeons and Dragons uh, that um, you could play. And I asked my mom and she was like, oh, you're not getting that. That's for that's the devil's game. Yeah, so uh... <laughs> Can we stop for just a moment? <laughs> now, a lot of people say that and they chuckle and they laugh. And I've heard that from a few people. Was that really what it was like or was it kind of like a wink, wink, nudge, nudge kind of thing? Well, no, that's literally what she said, Ooh. but, um, but, but it wasn't, it was less of like a religious, like, um, uh, my parents, my family wasn't particularly like super religious. It was more of just like a general, like conservative fear kind of thing, yeah. you know, that like, Ooh, I heard about that on the, on the TV and it's, it sounds dangerous and whatever, you know, it was just kind of like a, a not good fear based kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but uh she did uh get us the uh, marvel superheroes game so my brother and i uh devoured that i don't think we ever played it correctly but we had a lot of fun uh with it and uh and then in um in high school somebody uh in my art class had um the dark sun uh the 2e dark sun binders uh which i just devoured i was like this is the greatest thing ever and at every class and at lunch i was reading it so it was kind of this forbidden fruit that i got a little taste of uh, it wasn't until college that I got to play, um, which I had a blast doing. And then it was kind of um, set in stone, at least that, you know, that that role playing games are awesome. And, and I want to I play them. It's funny that you say you started with Marvel superheroes. That's from everything I can remember. I think I played a few games at Buddy's homes of like Tunnels and Trolls. And there was a James Bond game. Um, yeah. but I hadn't, I didn't have my own game. And I think the first game I bought on my own was Marvel superheroes. And I remember just like you said, I don't think I played it right because I remember playing in it with my sister and <laughs> I, I was playing kind of against my sister, which doesn't really make much sense. Like I, I saw games as adversarial and, and it wasn't really clear in my head yet what an RPG could be. How were mm-hmm. those first games like? Was it really Marvel superheroes, or or just in general? How how were playing? How was playing those first few games for you? Uh, well, uh, playing with my brother, I I think you know I, I'm positive we weren't playing it right, and I don't really remember all of it, but I do remember like um, appreciating the like system of like the kind of monsters manual of superheroes and the in the in the gamifying of like their powers and the in the hierarchy there and, and kind of pouring over that and i remember um we spent a lot of time uh designing like a base for our characters you know on graph paper and all this sort of stuff mm-hmm. uh yeah but it was fun um but but in uh in college when i got to play i played in this um I was living in the dorm and uh, the RRA was running this game and it was like this legendary DM that had been running this campaign forever. And uh, it was a 2E game and um, I got involved and, and they would like rent out a room and like, you know, p- play all night. Um, and like some of the characters were like the descendants of, of other iterations, other characters from previous games. It was like this really, truly epic world with maps and lore and and uh, it just blew me away. It was just, it ate it up. It was awesome. Were you, how were you creatively, how were you sort of expressing yourself creati- creatively at that time? Were you building, like, did you start building minis around that time or painting minis? Um, were you no. doing other things or? Yeah, not really. Um, my background is more in fine art. Uh, I um, I didn't really start building and painting minis uh until actually right before I got on uh, Dimension 20. So like five or six years ago. Um, uh, but yeah, my background more with, and at that time I was doing like big oil paintings and like kind of weird uh, conceptual like performance art and uh, kind of subversive um, just art stuff, art kid stuff, I guess. Performance art. I automatically start thinking that this is related to role playing. Could I ask, because this is, we're off the rails now, ladies and gentlemen. I had no idea about this part of his background, and, and this is all unscripted from here on out. Um, what sort of performance art, if, if you don't mind me asking, what, sure. what were you doing? Um, so I think, I think it is related, uh, actually, um, and, and it's something I've thought about before, and it's interesting. I'd love, love to talk about it, but... Uh, yeah, we would just some buddies and I who were also like art students, you know, we had a similar kind of aesthetic sensibility and we were just doing kind of subversive, subversive art. Like um, one time we we set up a, a yard sale. So we advertised the yard sale in the paper and put flyers up and we just took everything from the house that we were living in and put it in the front lawn and, and labeled it with these really crazy prices, like absor- absorbent prices. And uh and then on the porch, we had this this guy, one of one of our friends, dressed up in this really wacky suit, with this loud music playing frontwards and backwards, and he had a microphone that had a lot of reverb, and he was the price master. And so, um, anytime anyone wanted to buy anything, that you know, they would be like, "Oh, I want to I want to buy this pen, but it says five dollars. Can I can I just give you fifty cents?" And we would say, "Go ask the price master," and then the price master would say. 
they would say like 50 cents and he would say 50 thousand dollars <laughs> you know so just like refusing to sell anything it was just this experiential uh thing that we did yeah. anyway, i like that. it reminds me of a lot of the stuff that i i've never i'm trying to think of if i may have sort of participated in stuff like that but back in college uh i went to art school and um i i have a lot of friends that would do things like that. Like they would stage a political protest, which was mm -hmm. a protest, but it was some sort of performance art where they would go up on the stairs of like the, the Capitol building or, or something for the, for the city, whatever, you know, when I went back to my small town or whatever. Um, and they would like put, put on something like to was, were you like just sort of playing were these, were these pranks? Was this, did you start did you start with an intention and say like i want to i want to prove how humanity is such and such or were you <laughs> like i want to do the prank first and then it's like i'll justify it later or no i think it's that kind of stuff was just more reaction to like being a young person who mm. was creative you know and like I, I i that particular idea came from like having an actual yard sale at, at a, a, a friend's house at the time and and the, there was kind of these smarmy like garage sale ladies, you know, who who came and like scoffed at our the stuff that we had for sale. And, it, and there's like a, and there's a whole like protocol and like hierarchy and things to to just economics in general or capitalism or whatever. But but especially yard sales, there's like these kind of mm -hmm. rules and things, and and people mm -hmm. are very kind of particular about them, and they get up early, and they're the first ones. I don't know. So we just thought, well, that'd be fun to play with a little bit, you know, and and uh, subvert. It reminds me of um, the stuff that Andy Kaufman, the comedian, would do. I think he walked into like a, he would walk around as that obnoxious character, Tony Clifton. <laughs> and he walked into like a, like he walked into like a bakery one day in New York. And he, he walked in very obnoxious and he tried to buy a donut. And they, they wouldn't give him the donut. So they were trying to kick him out. But then, of course, he's got like a suitcase full of money. And he goes, I'll give you $100 for that cake. And they run over and they get it. And then he'd like start <laughs> buying things. And he'd say, I'll give you $200 if you get down on your knees and eat it in front of me. And they do it for 200 bucks. And he's in this shop for like two hours giving away money to people to do it. And at the end of the night, the only thing left in the shop is the donut that they refuse to buy, that they refuse to sell him. And he would walk out. Wow. Like after it's like it reminds me of that sort of thing. So perhaps there's a little Andy Kaufman inside of you somewhere because yeah. the tag sale yeah. definitely reminds me of that. Um, was there anyone when you were younger that was kind of or or anything that was really particularly influential to you? Maybe that inspired you to kind of try these things or. Um. I don't know if there was like one uh, one thing. I mean, um, I mean, certainly my mom was a grade school art teacher, so she, oh. you know, uh, was always, um, you know, having me drawing and painting and making stuff or whatever, or just supported that. Um, mm. So that that probably was was a thing. And uh, I guess I mean, more than anything, probably just you know that the media and 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 stuff that you know you're around and the kind of like boredom of of being like stuck in a place and uh you know just making stuff up i don't know do you um so then when you go off to college and you're going for fine arts um and you start role playing are you at that point starting to put the creativity together with the role playing or is it more theater of the mind at that point where you're kind of like um you're like okay i just want to express myself and maybe it's a more focused way of say the yard sale or other things that you're doing in the past or. Yeah. Well, you know, the, it, it, my, my role-playing experience was pretty limited. I mean, at least in like the tabletop sense, like um, I, I, I kind of was, and it was kind of like isolated to, um, you know, uh, my uh, kind of that, that group of friends, you know, and then I, and then I was going away and making this art stuff with, with other, other groups of friends. So. And then the two didn't really, you know, I, I really didn't get to um, into um, painting minis and, and prepping for games or I don't, I think I GM'd a few like one shots randomly when I could convince people uh, 
to play with me but really i didn't play much D D for 10 or 15 years you know and i just was like getting the books and reading them on my own and there wasn't a lot of people in my friend circles that were they were gaming, you know, and every once in a while I could be like, oh, it's my birthday. Will you all come over and, and play d and <laughs> run a game? And people would be like, okay, you know. And we always had fun, but, you know, it just kind of was like outside of their experience. And, uh, yeah, and so then it was it was kind of, I guess, with 5e coming and um, and uh, I think, I, I feel like also probably was influential was, was hearing, uh, being able to listen to, the early um, actual play stuff, you know, like I remember listening to Acquisitions Incorporated and, mm-hmm. and Critical Role and stuff long before I ever worked on Dimension Twenty, just because I was like, I really want to, I really want to play D and D, but I don't know anybody that will play D and D with me. But maybe I can listen to some people play D and D, you know. Yeah, it really scratches an itch. Like I, there are certain there are certain actual plays I listen to, and to to be sort of honest like i often i don't have a lot of time to listen to them all because there's so much cool stuff out there yeah. but i tend to yeah. listen to the stuff that sort of when i want to play a game but friends aren't available or it's suddenly it's three o'clock in the afternoon on a sunday and i just can't mm-hmm. call everybody up i'll put something on and i'll kind of have it in the background and i'll be listening to it and it will like scratch that itch of of like hey i i sort of feel like i'm hanging out with my friends i sort of feel like i'm I'm going on an adventure um Mm -hmm. how about um what what do you think makes a session enjoyable for you like when you're actually playing are you more of a um do do you think you're more of a gm versus a player or um um i don't know i i like i like both um I, I feel like some a lot of people are uh, GMs thrust has have GM ship thrust upon them, uh, and it was certainly because they just won a game and they're the ones that are motivated, or or they want a certain type of game. They want to, you know. For me, I think a lot of the times that I'm GMing right now, it's like I really want to play this kind of like setting or this mm. type of game, and I don't. No one I know even knows about this or whatever. So so there's just not a. A lot of opportunities so i i have to uh manifest it but um uh i don't know i i yeah i love gaming i i like i really like uh lore and world building stuff i mean it's kind of what my job is and you know it's just something i i'm always up for is uh you know depth in in the world and the characters and you know if there's like a library that we're in i want to be like reading the books and Mm. you know i want to know who wrote them and you know Mm. whatever uh I can definitely like meander off off track a little bit because I'm intrigued by that stuff. But well, I was kind of thinking about that before the before the program. Um, I was trying to figure out. I I thought it seems like a very natural fit to me that a person who's say creative with their hands and likes to, and and whatever maybe form it may take, like painting, drawing, construction, building, or some sort of mix of both. I, I was sort of thinking in my head, like, I feel like that sort of a person is often into just looking around and sort of like observe, making observations about stuff, and at, at least in my impression, and then taking those observations and forming them into something new. And I thought, it actually doesn't surprise me that you, you say that sometimes you meander off and you want to check out the library, which is a GM's nightmare in a way, because it's like, oh my God, I need <laughs> oh, to come. I know. Because I, I hate, because I, I, it's <laughs> funny, because I've come up with libraries before, and I'm like, oh, I, where have I not set something? Oh, a library. I go into the library, and inevitably, three players want to explore all these sections, and they want to know whether or not it's filed by Dewey Decimal System, and, and <laughs> who's, what. and I'm like, what the, and suddenly, <laughs> I have to make up, it's like a trap. I have to make up the entire setting because if they turn a corner, then it's it's over. But it, it doesn't yeah. surprise me that. Do you think that maybe the exploit because they say that there's the there's the narrative, there is the um, the combat, and then there's exploration as like the three pillars. Do you think you're mm-hmm. an explorative kind of role player? Is that what you enjoy? Um, hmm, I hadn't heard that uh, before. That's very interesting. Um, uh i i think i think it's a mix of narrative and explorative because i do really it is super gratifying to land land a, a story beat and 
and uh i think that that is that's kind of to me that's like the funnest part of role playing is sort of that like intuitive like collab like you know improvised sort of dance of of between players and gm of like you know and, and that to me that's like the greatest thing about seeing all these professional um mm -hmm. role players is that they, they that's you know one of the greatest things that they they can do is sort of like read what's happening and sort of try to like go with the flow of things and and um help help those moments come to pass um, what i was going to say something too uh mm -hmm. that uh, about what you were saying is um it it's funny that you mentioned that observant thing because uh it, it definitely is a thing that happens probably to most production designers or set decorators or people that work in, in their job as dressing a set is that when you when you go into some new space or somebody's house i just walk around and look at stuff you mm -hmm. know because i'm and i and i'm thinking about you know when you're when you're designing or set dressing something it's like these things are telling a story they're telling a, yeah. they're telling about things that happened earlier today for this character things that happened yesterday last week 10 years ago 20 years ago they're telling all these these are all little pieces of their lives that that things happened to get there you know and uh and i love that you know and and, and uh yeah so do you grab inspiration or do you ever find yourself sort of like stealing things that you see not literally <laughs> from people's homes, but you go over someone's home and you say, my goodness, I was not expecting to see a Velvet Elvis painting on the wall, but now it kind of makes sense. I mean, do you ever see something and then say, you know what, I'm going to put that in a game or that's going to be a, like the next time I make a tavern or the next time I build someone's um, castle or, or something like that. Do yeah, you ever sure. Yeah, I think it's more just like more, I mean, you definitely, that stuff happens and I sometimes I will take pictures of stuff or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm like, excuse me, I'm just going to take a picture of your pantry. Um, <laughs> but, uh, right. you know, um, it's more like you just soak it in and then later when you're when you're doing it, it's like, oh, remember that one place or whatever, you know, like it, it kind of pops back up. When, um, when you were at school for fine arts, what did you what did you think you were going to do? Because I, I I'm not saying okay, so first of all, everybody knows that I wouldn't be doing a show like this if I weren't jealous of people that were making a living out of what they're doing. But I can say this, like when I was in school, I was never thinking in a million I would never think in a million years, ah, someday I'm gonna be the production designer on a role playing show. Um, what did you think you were going to do? Or what what did you, how did you see yourself at that point? Uh, you know, I, I didn't, I don't know. I didn't know what my, uh, trajectory was going to be. I just sort of, um, you know, growing up, there was never any person in my life or around me or whatever that whose, whose professional job was to be creative. You know, it just mm -hmm. wasn't like, like playing in a band or, or making art or whatever was, was, um, was like something that like an indulgent, indulgent thing that people did, you know, until they got a real job or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, uh. So, um, yeah, I didn't know. I, I, uh, I, um, didn't really, I, I was doing all kinds of odd jobs. I, I kind of thought I would just, you know, always kind of be a, uh, underemployed, you know, uh, construction worker or computer salesman or whatever, you know, and, um, and then I got into film production, um, uh, and, um, kind of out of desperation because I was like, man, this, this sucks. I got to do something else. And, and, uh, and it was, it was a big, it really clicked together for me um, because it was, uh, it was like a clandestine, like art project that, that you're doing with all these people that like, you know, um, no one who's not there in that moment building this crazy thing will really understand it, but they'll see it on their screen and, and think it's cool, you know, mm. and, uh, there's a certain kind of like intensity and like, you know, 12 hour days and, mm. or more and like all that stuff appealed to me. And, uh, so, so yeah, that's kind of, and then it was like, oh, wow. When I got into film production, I was like, oh, wow, I can, I can be doing these creative work that is gratifying and they pay me decent money and and that was kind of like okay this is the thing you know and did you ever feel because i remember like thinking to myself sometimes like it's and and i guess this is going back like 25 30 something years there there was never really a market for what goes on behind the scenes so a lot of times you would go to watch a movie or watch a tv show 
and it's just up on the screen. And I think maybe DVDs were probably responsible, and maybe laser discs to a certain extent, with bringing what happens behind the camera like much more into the public view. Did you ever sort of mm-hmm. think like what you were doing? You'll put all this thought and and hours and hours of effort into something that is going to be on the screen or on wherever for just a few seconds at a certain point and then it's just gone and it's kind of out of people's heads and and as much as you've like the effort that you've put into designing and building that world is just something that's there to create an effect that that willing suspension of disbelief for like five seconds of one shot did you ever sort of think to yourself my goodness or were you so wrapped up and just happy to be building and 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 doing stuff behind the scenes that it, you never really gave it any thought. Well, it's worse than that, you know, because sometimes you build whole rooms and they don't ever end up go there or that scene gets cut or, you know, it's like you build a gigantic thing and they, and they shoot like this much of it or whatever, you know? So, so it, it, but that's just, that's just a thing that you have to get used to uh, cause, cause it's the way it is, but which it should be, you know, the, <clears throat> the filmmakers, when they're coming to, to make the thing, they should have freedom to, to be inventive in that space and utilize it. It's, it's important, but um, uh, no, I mean, um, I think that, uh, you know, filmmaking is a tough industry in, in, in a few different ways. One of the ways is that it can be kind of exploitative. And, mm. uh, you know, I think a lot of people when they're starting out um, probably get taken advantage of. And, 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 I, and I mean, in the sense of like, there's probably, there's multiple ways people can take advantage of in film, but I, I'm particularly talking about crew and yeah. um, being underpaid and overworked and, and that kind of thing. And I think that there were definitely times where, where I was like, wow, I'm working really, really hard, like a hundred hours a week on, on this thing that mm. is not my thing or that I'm not, I'm not getting to be as involved as I need to be, or as, as yeah. I know I can be, yeah. you know, and uh, or or man, my idea is better than what this thing we're making, and I know right. it fits so much better, or whatever you know, all the things that you think when you're you know paint scenicking someone's wall or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I'm sure people who work for me feel that same way too. Sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, I think that was a motivating thing for me. I was like, I gotta keep growing. I can't just be a carpenter or a painter or whatever. I need to. I need to um, design things, and uh, and I I went back to school. I went to film school at uh, UCLA for um, directing uh, grad school, you know, and so that is is hugely been influential, uh, kind of in all aspects of my work and stuff. But but that was part of that sort of thing of like I, I gotta I gotta uh, keep going. You know? How did uh, if you don't mind me asking, how did the 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 training and direction and and how did that influence or perhaps um influence your your style of creation that was actually what i was going to sort of ask about next is something sort of related to that do things appeal to you say as a role player like when you're when you're playing them like certain things like maybe science fiction settings or whatever and then when you're being when you're a builder or designer do other things sort of appeal to you? Like, oh, I'd rather build something in a fantasy realm or, um, Mm -hmm. and and how much of that is influenced maybe by some training as as a film director or in the background of like Mm -hmm. directing like people? Um, Well, I think that, uh, you know, we all have probably our like favored genres or things even that you know and maybe just for that year or month or whatever you know we all have our personal things that we're really interested in that that we explore and and it's awesome if they can can be a thing that we get get to do for work but you know usually it's not it's you know it's it's prescriptive it's Mm -hmm. it's the stuff they're they're bringing you like this is what we're thinking for this season this this genre whatever um but I think a thing that I learned, I don't know where I learned this, but a long time ago was just that you kind of have to find a way to love it. Um, mm-hmm. And what I mean to say is like, you have to find your way in, you have to, you know, maybe it's a, it's a subject that you're like, ah, you know, I, I feel like this is like a ch- cheesy topic, or this is, this thing is just not something that I'm not that interested in. It's like, well, you probably just don't know enough about it to, to know what you love about it. So you have to like dive in, you have to read the Wikipedia pages and 
research and 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 go into nooks and crannies and find the the gems that 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 are meaningful to you and then bring them to that project and and convince other people that they're mm-hmm. also that like yeah. look at this thing i found isn't this cool and then and then it's like you got skin in the game you know and then it and then it's like you found a way to be passionate about it and you're also elevating it because you're bringing something that no one else thought of to it or whatever and so i guess that's my strategy for for um for dealing with stuff like that that's that's interesting because again i think that ties into the idea of the creativity aspects of it and and the idea of sort of like taking what you have and making it the coolest thing or the best thing or the most frightening Mm -hmm. thing or the saddest, like whatever it is, whatever story you want to tell with what it is you're creating, just making it the best that it sort of can be and finding that in inside of it. Um, That's, that's, it's interesting again. And it feels a lot, it feels very explorative. You know what I mean? Like somebody Mm -hmm. might Mm -hmm. go into a room and say, Oh, what a boring room, but you might go into a room and you're taking pictures of their pantry or you're like, oh, look at that, that soup can and the design and whatever. And you're noticing these details that, again, like there's something that people see on screen or people see in some form for a few seconds. But mm-hmm. all of the, the ideas and the feeling and the emotion behind it sort of comes from that person in the background that noti- takes yeah. note of that thing that no one else looks at puts it up on the screen and it creates a a believable sort of feeling or moment or well yeah and it's and it's it doesn't just have a visual impact you know especially mm. in in dimension 20 it's like you're you're influencing what's happening you know you're giving players and people creator other creators mm. improvisers ideas you know so so even if in a, even in the film world you design a set and then they show up and like wow that that part is really interesting or an actor does something with it or what you know like you're you're um in a small way you know mm-hmm. you're not but you are collaborating with them even in that those improvised moments um which which definitely goes into like battle design and that kind of thing you know yeah i don't know i would argue it's not even i i'd say it's not a small way i think it's a big way like i was again i was sort of thinking about like questions to ask and and things to talk about and and things that like what you do reminds me of and in a way you remind me like the things that i see and the contributions that you make remind me of the way in which like we've all seen the special effects reel or maybe the back the um the behind the scenes production of the director coming into the art department and walking around and just picking something up and going, oh, this is going to be so and so character, and the the production people are like, we hadn't intended that. And they're like, no, 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 this is going to be it. That's how I. That's it. Whoever, whatever this was, that's now this character, and that's inspirational in a way, and that's collaborative because if the yeah. artist hadn't gotten the raw screenplay or the raw idea, like if Brennan is like saying, oh, I want to do a battle set on a waterfall or whatever, if you hadn't gotten that you wouldn't have created this particular thing. And then he or one of the players might have not noticed that little item that you painted in there that's based on a can that you saw sitting in someone's pantry. And then suddenly there's this magical moment where you're seeing something unusual on on the show. Um, so I think I'm, I'll bet anything that you, those sort of things influence in a very large way. Um, I think we've kind of answered this question, but I'm interested in hearing, pitch me. I'm a role player. I only like theater of the mind. I can't stand all you people coming in here with your paints and your little minis. <laughs> I I must create in my mind. Why should I use minis, terrain? What, how are they going to, how are they going to change my game? What are they going to do for me? <laughs> Well, first of all, I would say if you're if you're if you love theater of the mind, you should just play theater of the mind because really D and D and role playing games are about having fun, I think, and and there's no right or wrong way to play them. But um, uh, it can be really fun, um, and it can add a lot. D and D five E in particular has a really well developed um, combat uh, tabletop combat aspect to it that that 
is actually a part of the game that you almost don't appreciate until you you understand why like things have a diameter of 20 feet or the move speed is this until you do it uh, out like topographically on a map and so that's that's just another fun aspect to it that you can you can uh dive into um you know it's 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 definitely fun it's fun to make the stuff you know probably the best the very best part of my job is uh when the cast gets to see a new battle map when it's dropped in you know and and uh and I'm sure that is the same for DMs and players when they when they unveil something and their players in that that kind of joy that you get from the players just being whoa oh we got to go over there what's that you know like yeah there's yeah. that there's that moment there's that spark of inspiration again I think and that that you know plays a huge role I think in in, in helping make like the game kind of come alive. Um, do you have a particular, and this may be a dumb, like, I don't know anything about what you do kind of question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Like, <laughs> do you, is there, do you have like a definition of what a great miniature or, or like a great piece of terrain is? Um, is there something where you go like, that's, that's a good piece mm. of terrain because it does a certain thing. It looks a certain way, or it says a certain, like, it, do you have a criteria? Yeah, I mean, I think. I think, uh, I don't think it's a single thing or whatever, but there are definitely mm -hmm. like different ways that you can appreciate, uh, a terrain that's been crafted. You know, I think, um, one is story, you know, like it, does it feel like it's, it's, and <clears throat> it's problematic when you're like, you know, not building like bespoke stuff for, uh, a one-off thing. Cause at home you kind of want things that you can utilize for different mm -hmm. more than once, but but things that really tell a story like uh, that, that have like kind of a logic to them, they don't feel like just somebody just stuck some foam and mm. rocks on there or whatever mm. that, that, um, th that there's a, it's a living, breathing place. Um, I think uh, playability, you know, like things that ways that you can interact with it, um, uh, climate, you know, doors, chains ladders whatever or just ways that you can move through it and that it shows like knowledge of of uh 5e and like you know movement speeds and distances and things like that cover or whatever um i uh, love a good piece of terrain that um is dynamic that that changes through the course of the battle uh so that it can you know there can be turning points in the battle that's inspired by something that happens with the terrain or whatever um, I think it's always good to, when you, when you're built, we, a lot of times we do like kind of, you know, gimmicks or conceits where it's like, there's sort of like a theme, like this is a tower defense, or this is a, like, you know, uh, we're, we're trying to protect someone while they cast a ritual or, you know, whatever it is, uh, or a monster generator, you know, something, but, um, uh, and, and then you sort of build in like, well, this is, this is this thing and it, and it can be defeated with, you know, with water or whatever, but you build in other ways that um, that that maybe you don't even know what they do. You know, mm. but you're building in other possibilities than than just this one railroaded solution to this sort of puzzle battle. You know, it's like, oh well, they could also turn that knob, or there's also those chains over there, and like, oh, that statue looks interesting. You know, you're providing places for the DM, especially, but also the players to to come up with stuff, giving them room, wiggle room to to do their thing. You know, right. And again, getting back to like you kind of sparking a lot of like creative aspects where you guys can like bounce the ball back and forth and, and probably just sure. like keep going until it's like super, like some super exciting scenario. Um, how is, um, so I, I see a little bit of your workshop back there a little bit. Some people have been remarking on, on how wonderful your, your paint collection there is. Like what, <laughs> what's your... <laughs> what's your setup like what's your workshop like you don't have to do this unless you want to but i mean like if you were to turn it around we're gonna see a, like what do we see in your well, I workshop think, there? i don't think i can i don't think i can show you what's in here right now because it might be uh top secret but oh uh, now you have to I, turn it I, around i, I live like several few seasons in the future uh from uh dimension 20 so okay uh <laughs> but um uh yeah this is this is like a three-car garage that i converted into a shop this is kind of my office slash like the paint room and i got a a desk i have a huge library of gaming books and graphic novels in here and then uh next door i have uh 
there. Let's see. Like past that door is uh, like um, all the kind of equipment and stuff that makes a lot of dust. Uh, so like table saw, chop saw, paint, like a big paint booth. And, um, and then there's lots of shelves of like uh, random things like bags of fire or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. It's just lots of miniatures, bags of moss, you know, lots of stuff here. This is all stuff that needs to be categorized or whatever. But, but uh, you know, I try to keep like a, a library of things uh, that we maybe haven't always used in the past or whatever. And then, you know, just a bunch of stuff that you accumulate. Is, is that, is there like a tool you can't do without? Like if I, if, if I were to take away all of your equipment and you're like, oh my God, it's like being set naked, like in a, in a forest and you have to survive. If I were going to set you naked in a workshop with one tool, what would the tool you need to like, or what would the most useful tool be for you <laughs> to at least sort of get the game, get, get some stuff up and running again? Well, I think I couldn't be just one tool, uh, oh. probably, but uh, I can give you a couple of tools mm -hmm. that are like core things. Uh, need a good uh, like hobby knife, exacto knife, like a number eleven, um, nice sharp knife. Um, a good good paintbrush that is not all blasted out that you can actually get stuff done with. Um, Got to have some some CA, some super glue, medium super glue. Um, I don't know. The list goes on and on. As you can see, there's tons of different yeah. tools and thing, thingies that you can get. And you know, basically, you, with that with that stuff, though, you can kind of do most things with like an exacto blade and like maybe a little metal file. Um, and all the other stuff that just kind of makes it a little bit easier to do stuff, or does it a little better, or a little more specialized. But that's kind of the core of the stuff. Do you have a particular like? Is there a Rick Perry method or approach? <laughs> Like, is there, I don't know. I don't <laughs> oh, know. okay. I, I, That's an approach. I, I do know that, yeah. I know <laughs> that, uh, I know that I can tell you some things that are important to me. Uh, -huh. uh, so maybe that is part of my approach or whatever, but, uh, is, um, uh, it's gotta, it's gotta have, um, like I'm always telling painters to like pull reference. Like it's gotta have, uh, like if we're painting something, making something, it's gotta have makes sense to me. Like I, I just, I, I have to be able to see story and logic and the way like why is that door there there's like or where does that sidewalk go you know whatever mm -hmm. like it has to actually feel real to some degree and uh, I mean all the stuff we're making is made up but mm -hmm. it has to feel kind of real and uh, um, uh, I, I like to um, leave uh, design choices like, like I, I really like to do design and build a lot of production designers they're more just designing and then they hand it off to a shop mm. and, and, and maybe an art director oversees it and they come and give give notes or whatever but i like to really uh be the shop lead and stuff and so um so that's important and then and then uh i like to leave some design choices to to the execution so like once we're once we're in the material and once once i'm seeing how this is coming together be like oh you know what this is going to be all blue like i'm changing it it's going to be all blue mm -hmm. it's going to be better this way or whatever you know i like to have that kind of improvisational uh moment to sort of like steer at the last second and land in the in the in the sweetest spot the coolest spot or whatever you know do you feel like um can we could we say that your your style has changed like over time like i know you mentioned having you know, gone, gone to school to, for directing and like taking courses in that. And I assume that that, I think we talked a little bit about how it helped influence you a little bit, but do you feel like your style of, of maybe in the years that you've been doing this has sort of evolved over time or, or changed at all? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think we've definitely gotten better and more ambitious, uh, you know, um, with the stuff that we're making. And uh, I think having just, we're, I think we just, we just wrapped up our 16th season. So, you know, not all of those have miniatures, but a lot of them do. And so it's a lot of like territory we've tread. And so we're kind of like looking for um, new things to do, you know, uh, so maybe it, maybe that's a, a push in that direction. And just, I think also just having body of experience, you know, like, like having done something once having, you know, I, I think of like creative stuff like that. Uh, it's just a lot of tricks that you build up over time, you know? So like, 
it's like you get into this creative challenge the situation is like how do we do that like and then you solve it like oh we could magnetize this here or whatever mm. and now you've got that it's another tool that's in your tool bag mm. and so the next time you have a thing a challenge you can be like well we could do what we did last time but what mm. if we did this and you so you just keep building skills and tools and things like that tricks that um so i'm sure that that it has an effect too yeah it sort of feels like you're going deeper with like because like in a weird sort of way i mean there's some things i assume that you're doing that um you know are old tried and true methods but then on the other the thing that the x factor that kind of changes a lot of stuff here is that you're doing this for an actual play where it's got to be to a certain extent interactive and also mm -hmm malleable story and narrative wise which is actually something that one of one of the comments we got in the, in the chat so um joseph adams was saying and this kind of to me it may, it's a question i was going to ask like how much are you pre-planning the terrain um for the story versus creating terrain kind of for those moments like on on the fly like are you ever like as I thought you had mentioned this, but maybe I'm wrong. I thought you had mentioned that because some of it was, uh, because it's it's taped, you can always go back and kind of adjust what you made as a model or, or change it or whatever. Um, are you doing stuff beforehand and then you sort of get it out there and then it maybe doesn't work? And then so you decide to sort of go back and refilm or rebuild and then refilm? Mm, no, um, we we, because, you know, these boards take like, a week of shop time a piece you know generally some more some less and then before that there's like the design period and then you know we're ordering materials like miniatures or elements of the set that may take a couple weeks so you know we we spend like a month or so uh preparing and sort of build out the whole like okay we're gonna have these eight battles mm -hmm. they're gonna be roughly every two episodes or whatever it is and um these are going to be the bad guys and this one, I mean, we make a whole, almost like a big um, uh, writer's room kind of like board of, of these things, which actually helps shape the arc of the season because, you know, it's like, these are, these are kind of pillars that are part of this arc that you can build off of, you know? And, um, and so uh, we, we, we have to do that all in advance. And then, um, uh, I mean, I think part of that, the reason that this question is asked speaks to the mastery of Brennan and other DMs to to do it in such a flawless way that it seems like they just somehow happened there right. at that place. Not that we decided it like a month and a half ago. And, you know, and, and uh, but um, sometimes we will try to accommodate changes or things that, you know, where it's like, we'll hear, you know, because like maybe we're still working on the later battles, but they're already shooting the first couple and then we hear about this or, or a mini gets added or something and we'll try to try to change things accommodate um stuff you know and just try to keep making it making it better or whatever but um it's a weird it's a very strange dance it's interesting and, though and like it, as far as like things so so they sh we shoot the battle you know on in a battle episode and then in post-production uh michael shawbach uh the director and and the cinematographer and um, so somebody or, or a couple of people from from my team will go back and shoot close ups of what happens. Uh -huh. So they'll recreate, they'll recreate the thing yeah. and they'll move it and they'll set up shots and they'll light them and put a little haze in there. Mm -hmm. Or uh, sometimes they'll build like little things like someone described pulling a book. So let's make a little teeny book and, and you know, stick it on their hand. They'll right. do little, little touches to kind of sweeten it up. Right. Um, but it's, it's basically the same set. Okay, I think that's probably what it was that you were speaking about, and I probably misinterpreted it. Um, that's the idea. Uh, like, I love this idea of you being like in a writer's room or having a meeting where you sort of sketch out the whole season. Um, when I think about it, I think about it from a writer's perspective, and I think as a like as a writer approaching it you know, a writer might sit down and say, okay, well, the climactic battle is going to take place on a waterfall. So for three battles prior, or I'm going to show water spirits are hiding in the mm -hmm. backgrounds and all that. Are you, I assume, sort of doing that sort of a thing from from the physical uh, or virtual, uh, depending on what you're doing, standpoint? Um, are you kind of like saying, okay, well, wouldn't it be neat if maybe mm -hmm. in the first battle 
just here hidden in the background we see something like this here and then later on it's going to pay off because in three battles we're going to learn that such and such is right there or there was a reason or is that the sort of uh back and forth maybe that you're all sort of sometimes i think i think uh we definitely do look at them as like a season. Well, we have that that kind of battle there, and then we have this here, and like, oh, well, but if we have this as the first and this is the last, that's a bookend, and like, you know, or or we can nudge things around, but um, and and put put in thematic things or clues or whatever. But um, I think a lot of that uh, comes from Brennan or or the other DMs um, of of just. Uh, uh you know just like you know jasmine or bria like they're just so good they just come up with stuff and, and that is just good good deeming you know of, of it's always a treat for me to get to to um spend so much time developing these basically these these interstitial episodes that are the combats and then like i don't i know like vaguely what happens in between but i'm not part of the mm -hmm. team that that's like orion and the dm that are that are going into the nitty gritty and coming up with all this uh npcs or whatever you know and so then when i when i'm watching we're taping it's like oh wow well that's interesting you know like this this part and they link things up so it's kind of like this dance it's like we we do stuff and then they do stuff and the players do stuff and it kind of just uh comes together it's interesting it reminds me of i had actually done an interview a few months ago uh a fellow by the name of lex starwalker who um who's um podcast I listen to a lot and he had described the game itself as almost and I never heard it put this way but as basically like a performance um and it happens one time and it's kind of over and done with and in a weird sort of way I feel like that's sort of a little bit of like you're doing all this preparation beforehand sort of practicing but then when or in planning but then when it comes down to those moments where you're playing the game it sort of goes wild and you just sort of do it it becomes whatever it is and it's a one time mm -hmm. thing and i guess that there's a little bit of you have a little bit of play or possible if someone's taping it or whatever but i i assume that for the most part it's just yeah. it's it's what you see is what you get and that's what happened um but it's like a captured performance in a way and mm -hmm. what you describe just sounds so much um so much like that um i think about it a little bit like uh it's like working with like a two part epoxy where, you know, it has a cure time and it's like, you're mixing it, you do all this stuff. And then like, you can keep kind of like messing with it messing with it, messing with it. And then when it sets, it sets, it's done. You know? Right. And, and that's kind of how the show is. It's like, it, we had a lore keeper who was, who was, uh, is involved now, Molly and it was great. But at first they were having her come to all these creative meetings and it's like, this is she's like this is so mushy and not the real thing it's like well it's not the real thing until it comes out of their mouth when the camera's on it's never really fully set in stone until then and then it is you know do you ever see your stuff like are you ever like watch later and go oh my gosh look at what they <laughs> did like i didn't expect that or do the players or or the gm uh brennan or any of the others um ever like sh like just surprise you with what they've they've done with your all the time your creations all the time i mean they're all the cast but especially the the gms because i i get to sort of be so behind the scenes and i know what some of this creative talks or questions or things and it's like and i know that they just i can certain things i'm like i know that that they just made that up because it did never come up before you know and, and it's so impressive mm -hmm. it, especially from my perspective like you know being being kind of behind the speed behind the the scenes or like in their brain a little bit you know to see i think i remember uh you know there's a one particular battle in um I mean, this might be a little spoilery but in um in escape from the blood keep from a few years ago where there was i know that there's an airship battle coming up that mm. takes place outside of this castle because i built the airships they're sitting here right next to me i'm looking at my watch i'm like that right. episode starts taping in 10 minutes there, and... there's only 10 minutes left and meanwhile they're like thousands of miles somewhere else they've like yeah. teleported somewhere doing something that was not planned it's like how is brendan going to get them back and and he does it every time it's yeah. so impressive he's like somehow he gets them back and it seamlessly flows in it, it just it's inspiring uh you know to work with those folks is is there someone out there and um i had originally sort of envisioned my question asking like if there's someone like a another creator out there that sort of inspires you but is there anyone out there like either perhaps in the hobby or outside of the hobby 
or in the in the business or outside of the business that that kind of inspires you or that you would you look to and you say I admire what they do um, and and I sort of like man I wish I could be as good as that or man that's someone that I want to like follow along with or is there anything anyone like that for you um I don't know if there's one person there's I, I take so much inspiration from from people all the time uh and in all ways I think uh you know I, I guess mostly online you know seeing seeing other creators and uh just other things people do with their lives or or who they're being or whatever um you know I think I I, I am really inspired by uh our um our cast and and uh, the team that we work with. I'm inspired by the the people that come and work with me, uh, who are you know way more talented in in uh, areas that I'm not. And it, it, you know, it's like so awesome to get to jam with other people. And um, yeah, I don't know. I don't I'm not one particular person, but I will say that like you know, there's tons of there are tons of really talented model makers and stuff on Instagram and on the internet who are like just making the coolest things for funsies in their house and mm. you can follow them and support them and stuff. So that kind of sort of blends into a question I was about to ask about what was it like to go professional <laughs> as someone that builds minis and terrain for an actual play. Like it boggles my mind. It's so amazing that people can do this. <laughs> what was it like to, have a team. Well, it boggles my mind in a good way, like in a dream way. Um, what was it like to like have a team um, working with you? And and can you tell me a little bit about who you work with and what's it been like to manage people to build minis and models and stuff like that on for for an actual play? What is how was that sure. done? Well, it, it does feel like a dream. I'm very, I'm very stoked. It's a weird, it's really weird to be a production designer for an actual play show. I, sometimes people will email me and be like, how do I get to be a production designer for actual play show? And I'm like, I think I might be the only one. I don't know. You know, I don't know. If there's a lot of uh, people out here doing You're this. You're the king. Um, <laughs> yeah. This tiny little kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, so our team kind of changes. It's all freelance work, you know. Uh, I, I stay pretty pretty busy, and kind of D twenty is my main main thing, and and uh, I just sort of take off when we're on hiatus. Um, but but I'm freelance, and everybody works for me as freelance, uh, and so it's kind of like who's available then, you know, and um, working that stuff out. Um, and and I think it's always like, well, what what are we doing this season? What kind of, what strengths do we need? It's sort of like you're building like a baseball team or whatever, you know, or an adventuring party, right? You, you're thinking about like, well, we need somebody who's going to be really good at this. Oh, that person knows LEDs. Let's get them, you know, and, and uh, maybe, maybe not everybody's available or whatever, but you're kind of just sort of seeing what strengths and weaknesses everyone has. And you sort of come together in like a a gumbo or whatever uh to get the job done um right now uh working with um raven bartlett and katie mcgeorge and shane brockway and jesse heron and um uh, marcel andre has been our, our kind of core team um this this last season uh and a lot of them are shane has been around since almost the beginning shane is like kind of our lead minis painter and, and uh, he's sort of tried and true and and Katie's been around for a little over a year, and um, uh, I think uh, Jesse and Raven, this was their first season, but they're great. So, Another great question in the chat, actually, that really goes along and ties into this. Is there anything maybe that, like, looking back retrospectively, like, that advice you would have given yourself over the last few years and in, in how, you've, how you've built the shop up or managed or or just you know interacted with um the the cast and crew or anything that like advice you would give yourself looking back on it something you wish you'd known mm. ladies and gentlemen i think we've stumped him <laughs> thanks I a lot know. joseph it's adams that's, yeah that's a tough <laughs> question um Joseph, maybe uh, you should be asking these questions, not me. Yeah, thanks for the question, Joseph Adams. Um, um, I don't know. I mean, I think like 
I have a thing over my desk that says the creative process. Um, oh, I can't, can I say a curse word on here? Or, Abs, on you can do anything you want if you put your <laughs> mind to it. Okay, good. Uh, all right, so it's a stupid thing, but I found it to be true. It says the creative process. Number one, this is awesome. Number two, this is tricky. Number three, this is shit. Number four, I am shit. Number five, this might be okay. And number six, this is awesome. And and I, I think that um, I have that up there because it's sort of like what you're saying. It's like I sometimes it's really stressful and really hard or, or the deadlines are really intense or whatever. And you're 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 nervous about um, making something that's good or whatever, you know, that's going to do something. And uh, and it's very it can be very intense and overwhelming feeling. And uh, it's good to to try to tell yourself, like, OK, we've been here before. We're going to go through this, get to the other side, and it's going to be awesome. And it always is, you know, but but there always is that kind of dark night of the soul a little bit uh, at some point in the process. What um, What is your collabor- collaborative process like? You've sort of hinted at it. Well, not hinted at it. You've kind of told us a little bit about it, but what is it actually like when you are sitting down or maybe standing up with Brennan and you're sort of looking at the battles and you're looking at the season? Um. Is it just like two creative people kind of, or I assume a few other creative people, just all throwing ideas around? Is there some sort of format to it? Um, are you guys arguing? Are you are you like um, trying to argue until you get a great like idea? Or, um, you know, are you just throwing weird stuff out and seeing what sticks or? Um, uh, so usually it's just, we try to keep small groups because I think it's easier. It seems like it's easier to to uh, get stuff done when it's less of like a committee or whatever. But so it's like usually there's like a bigger a bigger group at the beginning to like kick it off. You know the producers and everybody in there and, and and like we get the pitch and it you know and and um, you know it seems like it's more of a kind of internal uh, college humor thing as far as like what what a season will be i mean sometimes they'll they'll ping me and be like hey we're thinking about this idea or this idea or this idea do you have any thoughts you know we can't decide or whatever and and so i'll get involved but a lot of times it comes fairly well formed in that kind of genre and like the the pitch you know and then um and then we'll start having these creative meetings you know um we'll have them at least uh two or three times a week sometimes five times a week you know it's like an hour or hour and a half maybe two hours sometimes um and i keep a uh i kind of manage a um a spreadsheet uh that it, it, we used to actually do it in person with a big whiteboard and we'd like grid it out yeah i was about to this ask battle once this battle too you know and we would we would um also have a kind of a we have like a catch pile of like just concepts like oh what what about this concept that they're all you know tiny or whatever or you know like a battle concept or or maybe there's a bad guy that we feel is thematic for the season but we don't know Mm -hmm. where they fit in yet or whatever so it's kind of like loose bin of ideas and um and then um well you know usually uh with brennan at least and, and usually the other dms too they'll come in with like one or two like really concrete battle ideas like okay, there's going to be a cream corn ooze fight in the cafeteria. Right. Like this is going to, yeah. it's like, okay, that's like a fully form. Like, and it's also kind of somehow like a, a snapshot of the vibe of the season, you know, too, mm-hmm. in a way. So it's like, okay, that's, that's important. Let's, let's build out that one. And then we'll start kind of sketching and, uh, you know, filling stuff in and, and, and then you kind of run out of gas and then you, and then you meet again and again and again, and you sort of just keep filling in things and, and in the times between, you know, we'll go away and, and, and do research and, and find things, you know, and come up with other ideas to bring back to the next meeting type of thing. It, do, it does actually sound like, it just sounds like a lot of fun. I mean, I don't know it's if fun. it's always fun, but I mean, you know, I'd imagine all fun at some point can sometimes turn ugly, but I mean, it basically yeah. sounds like it'd be a lot of fun to, to sort of sit in that, sit in on that meeting and kind of like be part of the creative process. Um, what um, what sort of considerations like when you're, you know, you sort of have received the ideas and you go off to start building, like what sort of considerations go into building, say, for the camera, mm-hmm. um, versus building for the table. Um, I know also, I guess you're building not just for actually, 
there's a third part to that question. It's not just for the camera. It's it's also not for the table, but it's also to be sort of interactive and, and malleable in a way that it's going to not be, I, I don't know, I'm guessing now, maybe not be so precise that the GM is sort of pigeonholed into using it in only one way, but could on the fly be inspired and like maybe if the player says something and the GM wants to run with it and use it a slightly mm-hmm. different way, like what's it like kind of triangulating those three not good (laughs) you're just shaking your head it's next question it's it's a challenge it's challenging you know like like we have uh for the camera side of it you know there's like height things where we we start to build something and then it comes up in front of somebody's face you know so you're thinking about Uh, like 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 not blocking things also there's there's camera angles so it's like the cam there's a camera on this person but there's also a camera that's shooting across this person to shoot the other person so you know there there's like like uh stuff they have to worry about with height basically um we also have to think about um when they go going to go back and shoot the close-ups like okay we got to make all these walls removable and we don't really want the cast like standing up to look over a wall Mm -hmm. you know so maybe that wall has to come off at the beginning and we'll we'll put it back in the mini shoot um so those are considerations thinking about it has to also be kind of um, bulletproof in a way like it has to be you know um players are going to be improvising and and doing their thing they're not going to be you know um touching it in the most delicate way they're going to be playing trying to play a dnd game in front right. of the camera so you have to kind of make things that that work you know that if, if you have a mechanical kind of uh, thing that functions or whatever um yeah uh i mean yeah building in things that are are um our possibilities, you know, get giving, giving Brennan, um, uh, places to go, you know, because it's like, you try to predict what would happen, you know, you have your experience and you know, the cast a little bit, you're like, okay, well, they're going to start here and they got to do that. And then this is going to happen. I think that this, and I know that that person is a monk and they can move really fast and you're sort of trying to like figure out what, what may happen. It's never going to happen like that, but it might happen kind of like that, yeah. you know? So, so then you're also trying to think of like, well, I don't know what they might do with this chain, but I think that there could be something cool with it. Let's put some of that in there and let's let's add a couple other things. You know, the other thing to, to, that's important is to not put in details that um, that can be distracting or misleading because you're you're communicating the game mm. to the cast in a way when you're making this battle map. It's very specific and like they're looking f- for how to play the game, what the game is you know, what, what they're looking for clues and things of ways to yeah. interact with it. So, so you don't want to put something on there that does nothing or that is goes in the wrong direction or it's off thematically or whatever, you know, you want to try to keep it. That is interesting because I'm so used to, if I play at a table with my buddies, I'm so used to sort of taking some other mini. Sometimes I have obviously my own for like my own characters or whatever. Um, but I'm so used to just taking a mini as is painting it up maybe changing a few things and then presenting it. And then if my players go, oh, the orc is carrying a bag of skulls, I'm going to, and I can say, no, 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 no. That's just in there for effect. It's not really doing it. And I and I see what you're saying because on the show, if there's yeah, something that. that has like two cannons on it and it, let's fire the cannons. And Brendan's like, oh, actually, actually, there aren't any cannons. Rick was just getting really creative. Looks cool yeah. though, doesn't it? Let's not talk about it. So no, it's, it's a choice. It's like, oh yeah, we're going to, we should like, oh, it'd be cool if there was a cannon on there. And it's like, Hey, Brennan, can I put a cannon on this? And then he's like, Oh, cannon's a cool idea. Then he's like, I got to make stats for that. You know? So there's like this, this back and forth, you know? Right. And you, it's actually, it's interesting because it really counts, you know, like it counts in the way that it would count like in film or television because the players are actually like, it's, it's interesting because I feel like the minis are sort of elevated and not to say that they weren't before, but I mean, they're sort of elevated to like a real part of the game. And, and if it's not accurate and it's just something for like fun or whatever, it's not going to sell the game. And it's also going to help detach people from like the story and interrupt not just the players and the GM, but inter- interrupt the, the viewers enjoyment of, of what, you know, you're doing or what the, the story is. Um, do you have a typical day? 
like being a freelancer like do you have sets of meetings uh, you have to do every week or every day or no nah, i mean it's, it kind of it, it goes through uh no i mean it, it it's always kind of i mean there's there's uh it, it kind of is depending on the phase of the project you know so the beginning it's like a lot of meetings it's going to be a lot of desk time research pulling reference images and blah blah, blah ordering things budgeting things and then uh, and then we move more into shop time, you know? Um, so then it's like, you know, building things and, um, you know, it's like just messy, uh, painting days and stuff. And then, um, and then, and then go to shoot, you know, so then we got to move the stuff there. We got to load the set in, get set up, maybe prepare stuff for last, last touches on things. And then we're kind of there on set to, uh, we, we also do like spell cards and, um, ability sheets and all kinds of like other stuff around you know the cast to make their experience nice or whatever and uh and 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 uh, just kind of be in there to make sure things go well and to run in with something if they need it or whatever yeah. when you're when you're getting this stuff there like i've just thought about this like i like all these considerations are coming in my head and you probably thought about them way at the beginning but i'm thinking obviously you don't ship it because I'm picturing this box with this side up. And I know I worked at UPS for a few years and they, we were darn good. We tried. But this side up doesn't always happen. And are you shipping it? Are you driving it yeah. with like protective police, like with flashers driving it like along the, the road <laughs> well, so done, it doesn't get I flipped? Mean, yeah, my shop's not in LA anymore, but we have done stuff where we like, you know, have it in the back of someone's car, you know, board or whatever really well, like seat built it in and we've done a bunch of different things to, to get them there safely. But, um, uh, now we do mostly ship stuff, you know, like, like loose pieces, we can really bubble wrap and protect right. well and put in a box. And then we actually build crates and put the, put the battle maps in there and screw them in and, uh, and then ship them like that. So, okay. And you must, have you ever had anything? I'm almost afraid to ask, like get damaged in shipping or like, a few things, nothing major. I mean, we insure it, you know, and all that stuff too, but it would be like catastrophic as only, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it would, it would be what it would be. I guess we, we would figure it out. Um, yeah, but most things, and also we, the show, you know, these sets and minis are reused in the sense that they shoot close-ups of them and now they're doing like an auction thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so they're, they're assets of the show, right. That they have spent a fair amount of money to have made. So they, they go back in the crates and they get stored, you know, so that they're, you know, uh, available should they need them, uh, for whatever. What do you think about, um, just sort of shifting gears now? Um, so much has gone virtual these days and when i say like virtual i i guess i don't just mean through zoom well sometimes by necessity sometimes because it's a cool thing because i can play with somebody in some other country somewhere um what what do you think about like how that's impacting what happens with miniatures like um to me it's it's kind of like a question that i often kind of consider because the truth is when i was meeting with my friends in person, I, I would always, you know, we'd all bring our minis and I'd, and I'd be so excited because I'd make tiles and I'd have all my stuff. And now that I'm playing online, I always told myself, okay, I'm going to, and I do, I have like other camera setups and things like that. I always told myself, okay, I'm going to have a camera set up or two or three. I'll be able to cut between them and I'll show the, this is the mini cam and I'll show how things are mm -hmm. going. Um, but the truth is it doesn't quite have the zing. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. like it's a little because mm -hmm. I have to either move someone else's mini and they're not touching it and like they can't ship it to me just to play a game one at, once every yeah. Friday and all that. How like has Zoom, do you feel like Zoom has sort of impacted the mini market or the mini use of minis or? Um, I don't know. I mean, um, I feel like, uh, I mean, it seems like TTRPGs and D&D are in some insane golden era anyway and that mm. they're only just growing growing and I so I can only imagine like people being at home during covid probably there was a boom of people wanting to like just stay home and paint minis or whatever anyway but um we you know we did it we did it. we've done two seasons with a virtual tabletop oh actually we've done more than that but we yeah. did two with Tailspire which mm -hmm. is like a 3D uh tabletop system which is a great piece of software and uh 
and the folks over there are incredible like geniuses like they, they that thing i've seen a lot of them you know and we vetted a lot of them and um tailspire just does crafted really well you know and it, and it they have this ethos that's like they are they design that software to to look like miniatures mm. in the sense that like you know to not just be like a th you're dropping into like the metaverse or whatever yeah. but like it's like it, the the textures on them have like finger smudges yeah. and hairs and stuff like that you yeah know? which which actually i think helps it adds to that tactile experience and stuff but um you know that was a really interesting experience we definitely not something i have a lot of experience in before and it, you know virtual tabletop is probably not my go-to thing because i i would rather do it physically or just in person you know i really yeah. like that kind of game playing but um i play like several times a month and in, in virtual games on zoom you know because it makes it easier and um so i don't know i don't know how it's changing but it does seem like more people are playing games which can be a bad thing you know yeah I see it as like I I'm really excited by it. Like it's it's a really, I think a cool thing. And it's do, do you ever wonder why? Why do you think it's like exploded like this, or in the last like five uh, or six D years? TTRPG stuff. Yeah, like what? I, don't know. I, I mean, I think there's I don't know. I mean, whatever. This is just my penny ante stuff on it. But I think Five uh, E's a really well developed system. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I don't think D&D is like everything or whatever. I, I play other systems and like them, but it is a really well-developed for what it does. It's really easy to learn and understand and fun to play. Um, I think like there's definitely zeitgeist stuff about like, you know, nerd, nerd culture being uh, the, the culture, you know, like of, of media now, like, you know, all the Lord of the Rings movies mm -hmm. and, you know, all the superhero movies and, I think that like D and D is a corner that like this kind of like type of fantasy adventure fantasy is a corner that really hasn't been fully tapped yet. And, um, people are just kind of getting hip to it. You know, it's creeping into all this, all those other media. Um, and, and there's cool, uh, exploration and accessible stuff being created with, with actual plays too, where it's, um, it seems like, uh, that actual play, stuff online is this like space for young people to connect to other young people who might be different like them also or be mm -hmm. exploring who they are as a person or the things they're interested in or just it just seems like a really cool like radical kind of progressive space that i feel super stoked to be like even tangentially connected to and uh but I think that that's part of it too, you know, like that, that's cool. Those people are cool and, 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 uh, people like cool things. It just takes a while to, to catch on, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, do you kind of foresee virtual tabletop, like changing the hobby, affecting it? Um, you know, cause I think about the fact that, you know, if you go back and look, RPGs came out of wargaming. So it started with wargaming where people are, they're building the miniatures and it, it kind of links to what you were saying about knowing like the battle system for D&D &D or whatever. Um, so people are making measurements, right? And then they start thinking, okay, um, well, I want to tell a bit of a story. So let's tell a story for each one of the minis and that will be our role-playing part. And then the role-playing evolves sort of, it goes it sort of flips back like the pendulum swings back and now they're going to use minis and build tiles and terrain and all that and tell these stories um and and it's sort of you can use it to physically simulate battles and whatnot but do you see uh, this step towards virtual stuff as maybe taking it in any particular direction and opening up something new or or different hmm. in the future or i'm sure it will um yeah, it's hard to know. I mean, I, I feel like it's it's definitely going to um, give more accessibility, you know, uh, which is not not a bad thing. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I It's very interesting. Like, I, you know, I love uh, I love physical minis and stuff, but like, you know, it's it's really nice to be able to like drop into roll 20 or whatever and and play with your your friends or whatever, you know, very easily like it just it makes more gaming happen. Um, mm. Yeah, I don't know. Um, what do you think? Um, 
I, you know, I foresee a day when, I, I really think there's going to be a day when, uh, I don't know when, but um, people are going to put on the headsets, they're going to sit down, and I think here's the weird thing, you're going to have a choice, like, you can actually be in the setting, or I think, like you were saying, with Tailspire, you're going to be in a room. <laughs> you're going to be within mm. a simulated room <laughs> where you're at a table, but like it's like with the Jedi Council, where like you're all around the same table yeah. and you're actually moving stuff around. Um, I, I really think like one of the aspects of, of gaming is the socialization. Mm. And I think right now people kind of are sort of like happy with people being in a little window. But I think when they discover like, oh, as a GM, I could stand up and walk around the table or I could like elbow my my friend like when I tell a joke or whatever or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think that's a part that might be there are aspects that are missing, like the tactile mm -hmm. feel. I mean, I don't know. I'm totally guessing based on a bunch of William Gibson novels I've read and like <laughs> thinking about like stuff. But I, I guess... I don't know. I'm really interested. I kind of wish I could see it now. Um, and I worry a little yeah. bit. Oh, go ahead. No, no. I was going to say, I worry that it might overtake, even though that sounds really fun, I worry a little bit like it's going to overtake minis, either in an accessibility mm. way, because it's so much easier to just pay five cents and buy a 3D model that's going to drop down into your setting rather than spend five hours painting this awesome champion that you've just done. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, don't... I mean, probably, but, but also minis are cool. You know, yeah. like there is a really cool thing. Like, I think even, I don't I notice it more now, but it seems that there, you see a lot more like miniatures in things like, like even commercials or TV shows or whatever, you know, like mini miniatures are cool rather than like um, making like a 3D recreation of a crime scene or whatever, they're doing it with minis now, you know, because it, it, it doesn't look perfect. It looks handmade, it looks tactile. I, I think that there's a, um, a cultural thing that's been happening for a while, but it's, it's like a thirst because you have such a kind of, there's so much kind of meaningless or like vacuum, vacuous kind of like, there's a hole, you know, in a certain way of like artistic integrity and, and cultural stuff and media i think a lot of it is very kind of schlocky or whatever and and, and things like a little smudgy painted miniature it, it just connects to you in a mm -hmm. different way than than like you know a, a 3d thing or whatever to me yeah you, know, you can see that see the creator's hand there and you you know it just has a charm to it or something yeah i agree and i and i also think I feel like there's, and I don't, I can't articulate it yet, but I feel like there's some sort of weird connection between minis and playing online. And this is going to sound crazy, but artists and like AI art mm -hmm. somehow, like I, I, I can't even, again, I can't articulate it, but it's, it's like, I feel like there's something timeless about a person that sits down and, and does this thing they create this mini or they create you know it's it's almost like a portrait not just of the thing itself but the person who made it like in a way maybe i'm getting too much into it whereas yeah. something that you see like sculpted in a virtual world is just like something that just drops in and i'm sure there are great art i know that there are great artists there that can are yeah yeah do beautiful stuff but in general like the idea of a, a, a piece that you can light and move around and it's really there and you can zoom in on it with your eyes and it's really there and look at little details and feel the satisfaction or feel the beauty of like a shadow in the armpit or something like you don't see yeah, shadow totally. like i'm a, like a, that's a vogon i just realized i'm like i'm like a vogon <laughs> or something owed to a shadow in in my armpit that i found one midsummer morning um yeah yeah I think that's true. I mean, I, man, the whole AI art thing is so strange and, you know, it's not really directly affecting me at the moment, uh, but I am, uh, very curious about it. And, uh, yeah, there is some really interesting things about, you know, IP stuff and, you know, like just 
but it, but it, but it, you know, you have to ask yourself like, oh yeah, well, what if it's in like five years, there's a computer that replaces what I am doing or replaces you, what you're, you know, asking the questions that you're asking or whatever, right. you know I mean? It's, what? it's, a, it's a very I'm real offended. question, like, <laughs> you know, that, uh, it's definitely a weird question to be asking yourself, I guess. I never thought about that. You, we could both have someone that replaces us because we could just have some sort of program, like follow us around and record our personalities. Like this is what typically mm -hmm. Matt says when someone cuts him off in traffic. This is what Matt says when he meets someone. This is what he says. And this is what Rick says when he like talks about his inspiration. This is what he says. And then we can just sort of type in like, okay, meet Rick at 8 p.m. on Tuesday for interview. And then my avatar interviews your avatar and no <laughs> one knows like the difference. Yeah, And it's like, and we watch it and we watch our own interview and go, wow, I would have said that or something like that. Cause yeah, that's gotta be a weird, I'm sure that kind of stuff's going on right now. It's gotta be a weird feeling to, to be emulated. But you know, that happened to, it happened to Phil Tippett, uh, the stop motion animator that did, oh. um, uh, the star yeah. Wars films. So he, he is an amazing talent and everything went digital like after Jurassic Park hit. And I think Spielberg said something like, okay, Phil, can you show me what a stop motion dinosaur is going to look like? And, and he saw it and he was a little disappointed by it. And then he saw what the CG guys could do. And he went with the CG guys, but Tippett, Phil Tippett, actually, he still does a stop motion. And there's still, it's, there's an aesthetic and a beauty to it mm -hmm. that you do not get with super hyper clean, as dirty as it is, like hyper clean yeah. CG models. So I, I think there's always going to be, depends on your tastes and the shifting tastes of maybe the culture, but, um, sure. so what, what's on the menu for any sort of future projects that you have going? I know that you can't turn the camera around but how about just rick perry like separate from dimension 20 or do you have any sort of ideas for <laughs> things that you would like to sort of get going or um no i mean you know i i uh d20 keeps me pretty busy and uh it's it's pretty fulfilling especially getting to do be as a, a a kind of design person that also gets to do a little writing or whatever and be involved it's it's pretty personally gratifying um but uh you know i, I other stuff is just life stuff I have two small kids mm -hmm. and live on a heart fo uh, farm like homestead kind of place and and uh you know doing that stuff um is pretty gratifying to me also um i don't know i would love to uh do more you know i would love to um do some uh other types of uh work in miniatures uh whether whether like other you know D, &D sets or displays or uh or other things you know beyond um just D, &D. it's a it's a really fun uh arena to work in i've been uh, thinking about getting back into oil painting for fun. Oh wow! Making some, uh, making some fun paintings. I don't know. That's great. Yeah, it'd be cool. It'd be fun to do some uh, some um, formal um, RPG design stuff. Like try try my hand a little bit at like uh, writing stuff or helping design stuff. Well, Rick, thank you very much for your time tonight. Um, oh, yeah. you've been super generous and, and it's been great talking to you. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, and for, for you, the viewers at home, thank you very much for, for tuning in tonight. Um, I, I love doing this. I, I love the excuse of like, I'm basically being very selfish with this channel, just talking to all the people that <laughs> I really want to talk to. Uh, and I just happen to <laughs> get subscribers. So I like that. Um, but if you, if you do like the show and if you're interested in hearing from other awesome, uh, creative people like, like Rick, uh, please do think about liking and subscribing, but, um, also the, uh, great way you could help me out is, is just by sharing, 
um, or, or physically finding, grabbing your friend by the lapels <laughs> and, and like putting it in their face and, and then taking their thumb and having them hit the subscribe button, um, that would help me out tremendously uh, because it's just, it's, it's really nice when I can kind of connect the people that do this stuff with the people that are interested in, in hearing about it. Um, and like I was saying before, uh, I will be back on Saturday the 8th. We'll be talking to Jonathan Hicks, the creator of Those Dark Places. I think that's at 5 p.m., but double-check your TV guide, folks. Um, but at any rate, thank you all very much for, for tuning in. Rick, uh, just one final thank you very much for, for coming on the program. I very thank much appreciate you so your much, time. Matt. It was really a pleasure. Thank you, sir. So for all of you out there, uh, have, have a great game, and uh, please stay safe. I will see you in a week or so on the next episode of Roleplayer with a Thousand Faces.